So I will start over everyone. I do apologize. I was on mute. So let's start again. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Aisha Clark, and I'm the Interim Executive Director for Health Equity Solutions. HES is a nonpartisan statewide organization um, committed to promoting policies, programs, and practices that result in equitable healthcare access delivery and outcomes for all people, regardless of their race and or income. For years, we have called for intentionality dismant regarding dismantling racism. I know you're asking yourself why, and it's because research and experience tells us the greatest barriers to achieving health equity for all people in Connecticut are rooted in the impacts of racism on health. The state of Connecticut and over 20 of its towns declared racism a public health crisis. Now, how do we continue to address this crisis? How can the state policy be intentional in dismantling racism? Well, Connecticut's Path to Equity Guide to State Policy for Health Equity was created with input from a series of workshops in collaboration with many organizations across the state to provide policymakers, candidates, advocates, and voters a clear understanding of how we can make equity a reality and, you, and also share policy goals for addressing health equity. It's long past time to address the inequities in our state, and it's urgent for us to do that all that we can do in advancing it. We have looked at the categories related to anti-racist structures, diversity and inclusion, access, affordability, economic stability, and opportunities to be healthy. I would love to welcome one of our special guests, Lakeisha Grant Washington, who is the president of the Hartford Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Lakeisha, welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Well, good afternoon, Aisha and the rest of the panelists. First, I wanna say thank you for the invitation um, for us, me, the members of the Harvard Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated to join you um, for this discussion this afternoon. Um, thank you. So Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated is a private not-for-profit organization of college-educated women committed to the constructive development of our members and to public service with a primary focus on the Black community. Our purpose is to aid and support through established programming and local communities throughout the globe. We are a 501c nonpartisan organization that does not endorse candidates or political parties. The Hartford Alumni Chapter was chartered on June 14, 1947, and for the past 75 years, we have contributed countless hours of public service and programming that fulfill the elements of our organization's five-point thrust. Those five points are economic development, educational development, physical and mental health, political awareness and involvement, as well as international awareness and involvement. Today, I'm just gonna take a few moments of your time to tell you a little bit about one of those five point thrusts, specifically political awareness and involvement. Next slide, please. It is under the direction of our National, of our national Social Action Commission that Delta Sigma Theta mobilizes its members, chapters, and national leaders to advocate for the sorority's predetermined positions and objectives. We participate in social action activities that focus on enacting laws and policies to expand and sustain the rights and privileges of all people while protecting the most vulnerable among us. Some of our national social action priorities include DC statehood, educational disparities and inequities, health equity, redistricting, reimagining public safety, supporting gender equity, combating racial profiling, and voter suppression. The work of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated aligns and supports the work of HES as it relates to equity for all. You might recall that on the state level, that this pathway to equity guide is a step towards impartiality for everyone. 
just a little over a year ago in June of 2021, Connecticut declared racism as a public health crisis and a social determinant of health. We believe and continue to work for the freedom and justice of all as outlined in countless um, components of our American legislation to include the Equal Protection Clause and the 14th Amendment and Acts in the Civil Rights Act of 1865, Reconstruction Acts of 1867 and 1868, enactments of 1870 and 1871, the Civil Rights Act of 1875, 1957, 1960, 1964, 1968, 1982, and 1991. Yet despite all of this legislation, we still have an underlying problem in our country as it relates to racism. Racism still exists. The color, excuse me, the color of one's skin should not and cannot continue to be used as an element to deny anyone his or her human rights. Therefore, it is pivotal that people and organizations mobilize together to fight for and demand what is right for everyone. Some of the work of the Hartford Alumni Chapter and Delta Sigma Theta Sorority as a whole this year will, will include our continuation of advocacy for the improvement of life for the Black community with an emphasis on eliminating racism, effective implementation of redistricting parameters, expansion of mental health services, as well as equal opportunity for economic development and voter education and voter registration. So as we are just 40, 41 days away, from the election on November 8th. I just wanna take a few moments just to remind everyone who is tuning in today that your voice matters. Your vote is your voice. If you're not registered to vote already, it's not too late. The deadline is October 15th, so you still have some time. And even if you may have missed the initial deadline of October 15th, you can still register on the day of being November 8th. If you're already registered to vote, and something is happening, now you're sick. Lo and behold, we want you to be safe. Go ahead and request your absentee ballot. You can do so by visiting um, the state website at myvote.ct.gov backslash absentee to make sure that your absentee ballot is sent to you. And last but not least, we want everyone to stroll their ways to the polls. Make sure that you grab someone, grab a neighbor, grab a church member, grab a colleague, and make your way to those polls on November 8th. They're open from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Any additional questions that you might have about voting in this election that's coming up, which is very pivotal for all of us, please visit the state website on which to do so. So please join me and members of the Harvard Alumni Chapter as we stroll to the polls. Thank you so much, Lakeisha. We truly appreciate the Harvard Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated for your leadership, expertise, and insight on how Connecticut residents can take action today. Now I want to welcome Madeline Granado, Director of Policy, and Nicole from the who is the Policy and Program Coordinator of the Connecticut Women's Education and Legal Fund, also known as QUAL. Maddie, welcome, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Aisha, and to the whole Health Equity um, Solutions team, and also to Lakeisha for that really great presentation. Uh, my name is Maddie Granado, and I'm the Policy Director for the Connecticut Women's Education and Legal Fund, or QUAL. I'm also here today with my colleague, Nicole. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole San Clemente. I'm Quelp's Policy and Program Coordinator. Next slide. So just a little bit about who we are. Um, Quelp is a statewide nonprofit organization that uses a justice and equity lens to advocate for under-resourced and marginalized women and girls throughout the state of Connecticut. And we really work to close the civil legal justice gap and to create policy that advances women's economic security, 
specifically. And um, we do that through three main programs, which are our legal education program, which is our direct service work, our policy and advocacy program, where we lead a legislative agenda centered on women's economic security every year, and our advancement and leadership initiatives. And so through that initiative, we've just hired a community organizing director with the goal of connecting the communities we serve through legal education to the state capitol. And just a quick fun fact for everyone, we were actually founded in 1973, and that makes us one of the oldest still standing women's rights organizations in the whole country. And next year, we'll be celebrating our 50th birthday. Next slide, please. So we are really proud to be here and to have signed on to Health Equity Solutions Path to Equity. Here's actually a quote on the screen from our executive director, Janae Woods Weber, that was included in the press release that highlighted the guide. Um, and you know, this is a resource, this is a specifically from Janae. This is a resource that establishes a clear path forward rooted in anti-racist and intersectional policy change for our state to achieve health equity. We know that economic justice and health equity are intertwined and that transformative policy change happens when we work collaboratively together across community and issue area. That's why we are proud to support health equity solutions leadership in this work. So this is really the time to create intentionally anti-racist policy. And this guide and the policies that it outlines is a necessary part of that work and of that journey. While Quelf's policy work focuses on women's economic security, we really know that economic justice and health equity are deeply intertwined and um, that transformative change happens when we work collaborat collaboratively together. Racism is deeply embedded throughout our systems, our policies and our culture, but we can pass legislation this upcoming session with actions to dismantle or course correct problematic systems and structures. And this specific guide, Connecticut's Path to Equity, Guide to State Policy for Health Equity starts us off by outlining concrete steps to dismantle systemic racism and construct health equity in Connecticut. And we are um, especially proud and grateful for the inclusion of policy recommendations uh, in the guide around economic stability. In the, in the guide, um, Health Equity Solutions also defines economic stability as being able to work or study and get or stay healthy. So uh, the guide also highlights um, expanding paid sick days, which we'll talk about, increasing access to education and funding universal child care as key policies for economic stability as well. And we will focus specifically today on paid sick days, but we'll also highlight a few other priorities that Quelf will be working on uh, this upcoming session. Um, great, thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, so as Nicole mentioned, we'll focus our time largely today on the need for paid sick days um, in our state, which is our top priority for the upcoming legislative session. Um, and it's a really important issue, not only to economic security, but also, also to health equity, right? Um, so paid sick days essentially provide short term, usually hourly or daily time off from work um, to recover from an illness like the cold or a flu, um, care for a loved one that's sick with, you know, a cold or the flu. Um, seek preventive care or receive assistance relating to domestic or, or sex, uh, sexual violence. Um, paid sick days really protect workers from losing their job or their paychecks when life's basic circumstances happen that are so often out of our control. Um, we really believe that no one should have to choose between their paycheck and recovering from an illness, no matter how serious it is, or infecting their coworkers, attending doctor's appointments, or taking care of a loved one. Um, and that's really what we're trying to address here through paid sick days. So you might have heard over the past few years um, that Connecticut passed a really strong paid family medical leave program that took effect um, in January of this year. We're really proud to leave, uh, lead the campaign for paid family leave, which is the coalition that fought for in one passage of, um, of paid leave in our state. So some people may hear us talk about paid sick days and think, you know, didn't we already do that with paid family leave? Um, and yes, you know, to a certain extent is the answer. Um, but that's why it's really important, you know, right from the jump to do some level setting. Um, paid sick days and paid family medical leave are similar policies um, that are sometimes used interchangeably, which again contributes to the confusion, right? Um, but they're very different and they provide different types of support to workers. Um, it's important that we know the difference, right, so that we can advocate for more. The key difference between the two is how they're funded. Um, paid sick days are employer paid, usually through payroll. Um, you can, again, usually take a sick day for a non-serious illness, 
um, to attend a doctor's appointment or care for a loved one in the same circumstance. Um, paid family medical leave, on the other hand, is funded by small employee payroll contributions. You know, workers use paid family medical leave to welcome a child through birth, um, adoption, or foster care, recover, recover from or care for a loved one with a very serious illness. Um, and we defined um, we defined serious illness as um, an illness, injury, or impairment, or physical or mental condition that involves inpatient care or continuing treatment. And that's really the key difference. Um, it's important to note here that technically Connecticut has, you know, both laws on the books, paid family medical leave and paid sick days, uh, but our sick days law really needs improvement to make sure that everyone is guaranteed the same access to the time that they need under the law, um, which we'll get to in a minute. But here's just also a quick timeline on this slide um, to help keep us organized and, again, understand the difference between the two laws. Connecticut passed unpaid leave, or FMLA, um, a few years before the federal government in the early 90s. So we've really always been a leader on, on these types of issues. In 2011, we became the very first state in the nation to require certain employers to provide paid sick days um, to covered employees. Um, in 2000, 2012, that law took effect. Again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, also in 2012, the campaign for paid family leave launched and really got off the ground and began advocating for a system of paid family medical leave. Um, and in 2019, seven years later, um, we became the eighth state to pass paid family leave. Um, and just earlier this year, again, um, the law took effect and um, workers were able to begin to apply for benefits. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So access to paid sick days is really critical to racial and gender equity, economic uh, security or stability, and public health. It's really all just interconnected and it has been made even clearer throughout the pandemic. Without a national paid sick days policy or a strong inclusive statewide law, the pandemic further widened the divide between the two halves of our economy. One where more advantaged workers, most, of, most often white workers, had the benefits and resources to quarantine safely at home and one where workers of color and essential jobs face daily risks of infection. Uh, nationally, nearly uh, seven in 10 of the lowest wage workers who are disproportionately women and people of color do not have access to even a single paid sick day. The cost of taking unpaid leave can negatively impact a worker's household budget as well because lost wages can equal an entire budget for groceries, gas, utilities, rent, or mortgage payments. And we can all agree that everyone should have the resources to weather an income shock. So like a major illness, a lost job, a few missed paychecks without losing their housing or running behind on bills or having to skip needed medical treatments. Um, but the same workers who are least likely to have employment protections that would prevent those income shocks, like, like paid uh, sick days, are also least likely to have other resources to fall back on due to generations of racist and just blatant discriminate, discriminatory policies. Access to paid sick days also benefits public health because it's, it's really simple. When workers don't have paid sick days, they're often forced with little or other options except to go to work sick. And this is really how illness spreads and it puts their coworkers, customers, and other communities at higher risk of getting sick. Research also shows that access to paid sick days reduces visits to the emergency room, especially among Medicaid patients. Emergency room care often replaces routine medical appointments and leads to higher health insurance costs for businesses and higher family medical expenses for workers. Next slide, please. So as we mentioned, um, exemptions and carve outs in our existing law, as well as limitations on when you take a sick day and who who you can um, take, who, who you can care for, leaves too many workers without the right to paid sick time. So 12 supports legislation that strengthens our current law and catches up to policies across the country. So this legislation should cover all workers by removing the employer size threshold and lengthy definition of what, what it means to be a service worker outlined in our state's current law. Legislation should require all employers, regardless of size or industry, to provide paid sick time to their employees. 
Number two, um, legislation should eliminate the waiting period to take a paid sick day from 680 hours to immediately after the commencement of employment and remove the requirement that a worker needs to have worked at least 10 hours per week in the last quarter to be able to use that actual paid sick time. And number three, legislation should include all types of family structures and relationships by aligning who a worker can use paid sick days to care for with Connecticut's current paid family medical leave law, which Maddie talked about. Um, this will allow workers to take paid sick days to care for a child of any age, as well as their chosen family, so their definition of a family. Legislation should also include time to take care for a family member who experiences family violence or sexual assault. And finally, um, legislation should protect against future pandemics by allowing paid sick time to be used when a worker's place of work or child school or place of care is closed by public officials for a public health emergency. Next slide, please. Um, great. So as I mentioned um, a few slides ago, we are really proud to lead the campaign for paid family leave. Um, and we're even prouder that our state passed a really strong um, paid family medic leave law in 2019 that took effect earlier this year. Um, since January, thousands of workers have received um, paid leave benefits, which is really exciting. Uh, but it's also important to note here that, you know, advocacy really doesn't stop after a law is passed. Um, it's just a new journey that we're on, right? Um, and we're, so that's why we're still talking about and working on paid family medic leave um, even now. So now, right, we're working to ensure that workers know and understand their rights under the law and how they can apply for benefits through the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. Um, during the legislative session um, next January, we'll all, we, we will also monitor legislation that proposes, you know, any changes to the program um, and take a stance on whether we would support or oppose those changes. Um, we're also, you know, really using this election cycle, not only to raise awareness of the program um, and make sure that people know their rights to paid leave, um, but also urge candidates to continue to support the program and oppose, again, any efforts to weaken or dismantle the law if they're elected. Um, next slide. Um, so we are also um, an active member of the Fair Work Week Coalition led by Connecticut Working Families. Um, in Connecticut, hourly workers, many um, earning poverty rate wages, um, really struggle to earn a stable income because of unpredictable work schedules. Workers are often forced to go to work with little notice, uh, maintain avail availability um, for on-call shifts um, without any sort of guarantee that they'll actually be called into work. Um, and they often have their shifts canceled at the last minute. Um, when workers can't predict their hours or their pay from day to day due to unpredictable schedules, um, they're often unable to secure um, childcare, transportation, um, attend doctor's appointments um, or classes, right, to um, go to school and earn a degree or certificate, um, or just simply plan for their future. Uh, unpredictable scheduling really also negatively affects workers' mental and physical health um, because it increases the stress and anxiety of not knowing, you know, when they'll receive a paycheck or when they'll need to go to work. So we support legislation um, that provides predictable and stable work schedules to hourly workers, um, resting periods between long shifts, um, predictability pay for canceled shifts, um, and access to additional hours um, when they become available. Um, so I also want to note here that, you know, real transformative policy change um, happens when we work together. That's why we were really proud of Health Equity Solutions work, um, and we were proud to sign on to the Path to Equity Guide. Um, so in addition to, you know, their amazing advocacy, we're also proud to support a number of other, you know, organizational partners in participating in several coalitions um, to really make Connecticut a more equitable state. Um, so here's, yeah, here's just a list on the screen, but um, there's likely more. Um, next slide. So um, as... Lakeisha said earlier, you know, there's a big election coming up on November 8th, and we recognize that every time we go to the polls, we have the opportunity to cast our votes for candidates who will shape policies that impact ourselves, our families, and our neighbors and other communities. And that's why we're proud to share with you all our uh, Let's Get Loud voter guide to the 2022 election, which we released earlier this month. Um, we created the voter guide as a tool for women to equip themselves and their communities with the tools that they need to be informed at the polls on November 8th. 
And um, just a little bit about what the voter guide actually includes. It has some voting information and resources, including like key dates and deadlines to keep in mind before the November 8 election, as well as tips on how to advocate and organize this election cycle in your community. And it highlights uh, women throughout Connecticut history who have made a change and an impact in their own way. And it also highlights Quelf's key policy priorities, including background information, ways to get involved, and specific questions to ask your candidates. And along with that, we released our 2022 Candidate Guide to Women's Economic Security, which is a resource for all candidates running for local and statewide office this year. And the Candidate Guide includes background information, talking points, and policy recommendations on Quelf's policy priorities. So just... Um, a quick little uh, input there on um, just making sure that you follow us. Follow us on uh, follow Quelp on Facebook, Instagram, and we now have Twitter. Uh, we are always happy to speak with your organization, with folks on this call, with um, you know whoever any community or network about our work and or the voter guide specifically. So please feel free to send uh, Maddie or myself an email if you're interested in partnering in that. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much uh, to both of you for the work uh, that you're doing and the partnership with Quelf. Uh, we really honor the fact that you are standing with us in solidarity in this work that we are doing. There is always this time that we stayed, if not now, then when? So in the wake of the loss and resulting from the pandemic, and an increased awareness of devastating loss caused by systematic racism that each of these organizations that I have presented and ours know that has been longstanding. We must advance anti-racist structures, diversity and inclusion, access, affordability, economic stability, and opportunities to be healthy. And this means taking concrete steps to address the racism that's embedded in our state government structures. So we would love for you to download the PDF version that's located in the chat of our Path to Equity Guide. We also have it um, in a HTML version and a screen reader accessible version that's uh, listed in the chat. Health Equity Solutions, also known as HES, strives to ensure our products are accessible to all Connecticut residents. Please don't hesitate to reach out to share any concerns, challenges, or comments about the guide. We are listening and we welcome feedback. Thank you for the following. Thank you to all of those who've signed up in solidarity. And we are also looking for in additional individuals who would like to be a part of the work that we're doing. I will now turn it over to Karen Siegel, our Director of Policy here at Health Equity Solutions to address some questions and provide some answers. Karen. Thank you. Um, I just want to encourage everyone uh, who's on the call to please put any questions you have in the Q&A box and we will um, share them with the panelists. And I just want to start with this first one that came in for Quelf, which is, um, has the 680 hours always been the wait period for the first for the first sick day for some workers? And has there been a legislative attempt to change this in the past? Um. Yes, yeah, that, that's a great question. So to my knowledge, um, it's always been in, in our paid sick days law, which passed in 2011. Um, to answer your second question, um, there's been a few different efforts over the years. Um, you know, the law is like 10 years old now, more than 10 years old, um, to go in and make some changes to it. But this, I think this year and probably starting last, last session, right, is really the first time that we're really trying to get like more of a coalition and a con more concentrated effort together to, to really bring attention to the issue, so. Thank you. I don't see any additional questions um, in the Q&A right now. I um, have one that I'll ask and then I can go back to the Q&A, which is, you know, the, the guide itself has a, at least something like 25, 26 um, policy recommendations in it. And I know that you each, um, Lakeisha and, and folks from Quelf, you each spoke about your key priority issues. Are there other policies represented in the guide that are particularly important to your organizations and the people you represent? Um, and could you share what those are if there's, if there's anything on the top of your mind? 
And to give you a second to think, I can um, pass it to Aisha first to talk about some of the things that HES is focused on. If, if I'm not putting you on the spot, Aisha. No, you are perfectly fine. So some of the things that AM, HES is focused on is um, looking at the affordability of healthcare. We wanna ensure that the federal level is raised to ensure that individuals are able to, to have affordable health care. We understand that there are many individuals who are missing out on uh, getting health care based on the amount of money that they earn. So it's important that we are raising that federal level to ensure that other individuals are receiving that care. This is also inclusive of ensuring that immigrants are receiving, um, having affordable health care as well. Some of the other things that we're doing as we're um, wrapping up our listening sessions and hearing from the community community is that we want to ensure that community health workers are um, certified um, in getting reimbursement for the work that they're doing. We know that community health workers are a benefit as it relates to access to uh, health care quality of care and also understanding some of the things that are happening within the community. They are the best expert, experts and trusted messengers, and they are important for the communities that each and every one of us are serving. And so we have found that that has been something that we would like to um, look at in some of the things that we've been hearing. Some of the other things that we also have been hearing within our listening sessions is really looking at um, how our um, community benefit and hospitals are um, spending um, what they are as it relates to community benefit and ways that we can work with our community, getting insight from our community, hearing from our community about how the community benefit can be worked out. Um, lastly, and then I'll turn it over to um, Lakeisha, if you have any different um, things that you would like to add, um, is really looking at medical debt, right? How the, the impact of medical debt, medical debt is hurting our communities, and what are some ways that we can work with providers in order to uh, decrease that and shift the dynamics of having policy changes as it relates to medical debt. So I will turn it over to Lakeisha. Um, I know that we're, we're putting you, you on the spot with that question, but I'll turn it over to you all and, and to discuss what the Harvard Alumni Chapter is doing. So thank you so much, Aisha and Karen. Essentially, all of the work and our advocacy from our organization as a whole and under the direction of our Social Action Commission will always be linked to our five-point thrust. But specifically, if I had to identify a couple of things that will probably be on our radar um, had related to one of those five-point thrusts, if we think about um, educational awareness and um, economic awareness, so educational development, economic development, specifically making sure that um, some of the laws in the last session as it relates to African-American history and things of that nature are actually implemented and taught in the schools um, as part of the standardized curriculum in the state of Connecticut. Additionally, um, looking at the um, student debt crisis. You know, so um, I know most people are very, very happy to hear what Biden's administration is doing around either the $10,000 or the $20,000 as it relates to debt. And there's still some, you know, drive to, you know, eliminate all student debt. But also I believe there's something in Connecticut in conversation around student loan debt for individuals who graduated from the state uh, university and, and state institution. So that correlates and corresponds to those two particular five point thrusts. Um, as it relates to um, voting rights, voter education, voter suppression, you know, looking at redistricting and what that is really going to look like and be implemented effectively um, in the state of Connecticut as it relates to, you know, who is representing us in office, which goes back again to voter registration and voter education and making sure that you exercise your voice through your vote and how important it is in which to do so um, and use that as a mechanism to connect with those representatives who you elect at the state level to represent you at the, on the Hill. Um, because at, under physical and mental health, also um, as it relates to um, women and children um, and girls, you know, we are very concerned with and want to stay abreast as to what is happening with um, paid medical leave, right? And an equal working wage. Because as mentioned by our uh, fellow panelists here, we know that individuals who are working those direct service jobs you know, with, without that stability, it hinders their ability to go back to get retrained, and thus it has a direct impact on their economic growth, and thus 
for keeping them remaining in poverty. When you look at the vast majority of the population and who that is affecting, it is affecting the black and brown community, right? So at the basis of what um, Delta Sigma Beta Sorority Incorporated does, and then here in the Greater Hartford area, which would be the Hartford Alumni Chapter, is looking forward to advocating and continue to support the enactment of laws and policies for the improvement of the black community. So I hope I kind of touched on a couple of things. Um, of uh, and being put on the spot, but that's okay. <laughs> HES will put you on the spot. And so Nicole, oh, Madeline, we want to invite you before Karen goes back to the Q&As that's uh, in the chat box. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I would say that Guelph, I mean, we really, we really focus on um, and prioritize policies that focus on uh, and, and center inclusivity, intersectionality and equity as like, um, and fundamental human rights. So one of those one of those policies that we really work um, in collaboration with other partners are um, the, the Husky for Immigrants campaign. So um, we do believe that access to health insurance and healthcare regardless of age or finances or immigration status is a fundamental human right. And it is so critical and so important to everyone's livelihood, to communities that we serve. And so we are um, advocates for that work as well, that policy priority. Uh, and we really hope that, um, you know, we've seen some great traction in the past couple of years in this campaign. And we hope that we can continue to fight for equity, health equity and health access for um, folks, uh, regardless of immigration status as well. Thank you. And um, well, is there anything else you wanted to add, Maddie, before I, okay, I'm going to go back to the Q&A. Um, and this is a question for Quelf. Does the legislation address the number of paid sick days? This is also an issue for some. This is a question from Katie Hinderer. Um, yes, th thank you, Katie. That's a great question. Um, very, yeah, very aware that it's a big issue for some, especially during COVID, right? Um, as like the requirements of how long you needed to quarantine for like have changed um, a bunch of times where right? it used to be 10 days and you know our sick days law only really um, covers five days for people who are even eligible under the law. So it is a big issue. Um, we're um, definitely looking at it this year and trying to see how, um, how other states um, have handled that and what, how, how many days other state laws provide. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that we are, are looking on, lo looking at, so. Thank you, Manny. And then, then the next, um, this is a comment from Kathleen Callahan. Thank you and all of you for this work. So appreciate all you are doing. I'm digesting the gut in pieces. Affordability is key to our work locally, access to the healthcare and housing. Thank you, Aisha. And then we have a question from John Olin for HES, which is which committees in the General Assembly will take up HES legislation? Um, so I can, I can take this one quickly if that's all right, Aisha. That is perfectly um, fine. So we do expect to see the, the Public Health Committee consider finalizing a doula certification process. We are uh, optimistic that the Human Services Committee will consider Medicaid reimbursement for community health workers and lay health workers. And there are also some other issues that apply to the General Assembly more broadly. Um, so afford affordability uh, also would likely go, th uh, <coughs> I apologize. The medical debt related provisions would likely also go through public health. Um, and we have also been advocating for all legislators, particularly during the onboarding period, have education about health equity and about how our state's health systems work as they're growing more and more complex, um, but really leaning in um, more heavily on all legislators should have training on how to use a racial and ethnic impact statement on a bill, why systemic racism plays a role in policymaking and how it impacts health. Um, we'd really like to see some education upfront for, for our policymakers on those issues. Um, and if other folks wanna chime in on what committees they expect their priorities to go through, please jump in. And please continue to share your questions in the, in the Q&A box or the chat. I know the priorities that Qualf mentioned, um, paid sick days, fair work week, and paid family medical leave are all in the labor and public employees committee, so. 
Okay, so I'm going to throw another one out to the whole group and then this, um, unless something else pressing comes up in the Q&A box or the chat, this might be our last question for the afternoon, which is, how can Connecticut residents support these initiatives? Are there specific um, types of advocacy or action that you think would be really helpful in, in pushing forward the things that you are advocating for? Okay. And why don't we, oh, sorry, I was gonna say, why don't we start with Lakeisha because we haven't heard from you in a minute. <laughs> So clearly Karen is enjoying this putting me on the spot, but that's okay. I was ready this time. Um, I think what we would want all community members to do, right, outside of exercising your right to vote, I can't stress that enough, but also just because it's around election time does not mean that should be the only time in which you're engaged in who's running for office. You know, so sending the email to your state representatives and your state uh, state senators, you know, trying to make sure that you get on the calendar that there's some piece of legislation that was mentioned today and you have a personal story about it that you sign up to give in a testimony. Flooding, and I know this is very much so old school, but letters, good old fashioned letters and campaigns so that your representatives and state legislators and state senators understand what is important to you. They are representing who you are. So I would say the biggest thing that I can think of how we want to get the community involved is to make sure that their concerns are heard. You know, send an email, send a good old fashioned snail mail letter, you know, and place phone calls. Um, so I would say probably be on the lookout across all organizations that are represented here today when they put out those um, calls to action, asking you to send that email or flood, you, you know, your state representatives or state senators um, lines. Their aides may not be happy, but that's okay, <laughs> with those telephone calls and those emails prompting them so that they know what's at the forefront of the needs of the community. Um, yeah, I, I would second um, everything La Lakeisha uh, just said. Um, I think the easiest way to stay in touch with Quelf's work um, and kind of what we're doing and receive those action alerts throughout session is to su subscribe to our email list, like us on Facebook, um, and like share our, our social media posts. I and mean, it's hard to get the message out there lately. So that's really helpful. Um, we have a really great voter guide that Nicole highlighted a few minutes ago. Um, that includes a ton of really great resources and tips on, you know, getting to the polls, advocating and organizing in your own community this election cycle. Um, and it also includes some sample questions that you can be asking your candidates this election cycle um, about Quelf's priorities, right, but they're easily um, kind of like transferable to other issues that you care about. Um, I will also say it's never too early to, to be thinking about, you know, an issue that you'd want to, you know, submit testimony on, you know, in March, February, whenever public hearings start and like feel like they're never going to end. <laughs> um, but it's, it always, you know, it's, it gets really busy. So however you can plan ahead, if there's something that you know you want to be active on, I think it's really important now. But I don't know, Nicole, if there, there's anything I'm, I'm missing there. But Yeah, I mean, I would just, I don't think you're missing anything. I would just reiterate and list, um, like some... One of the things that comes to mind is uh, we do have a page on our voter guide that brings up like five things to do before you vote. And um, those things are like create a list of needs, right? Like what do you see in your community? What are the needs that impact you and your family? What are the needs that impact, uh, you know, your neighbors, your community members? And um, really research after that, like maybe research candidates, right? What, who are the people that are going, that are you, can potentially be voting for, right? Who is going to be on this ballot? Um, what do they prioritize? What are the things that they're going to be working on? What, what do, like, and to Maddie's point, um, asking them hard questions about like, what, where do they stand on the issues that pertain to you, that affect you? Um, and then, you know, registering to vote is very important, advocating, so getting loud on social media, um, on, it, uh, pr probably like maybe organizing some social events with friends or family or other community members to really highlight what these issues are that affect um, folks in your in your life and how they affect other people and campaigning events as well. And then finally, like organizing. So joining a campaign, um, coming together in community, like that's really important, important uh, people coming together and um, 
elevating their voices in community is, is really essential in this work. So I think that's uh, some of the, the hot tips that we have for, from Quelf's end um, that I would just add there. And, um, you know, I, I always say this, legislators are elected to uh, represent community, right? And to really work for you. So I think um, it's really important to be part of this legislative process and make your voice heard in the legislature as this new um, session starts because uh, they really should, legislators really do, should care about the issues that um, pertain to the communities they serve. So thank you. Thank you. And from HES's perspective, um, everything that everyone said, um, the one thing that I will add is take every opportunity when you're meeting a person to use that as a networking of what the issues you would like to see. And so when it comes to understanding your own health or equity as a whole, it's an opportunity to share those things. And so make sure that you understand that you have a voice that. There are many people who will share that there are communities who don't speak up or communities who don't know what's going on. Within HES, we want to ensure that in, in empower individuals to speak up about the things that they are concerned about. Um, with us as well, please uh, follow our uh, websites, our social media handles. And on our website, we do have a blog that talks about many of the different topics that we are looking at and that we've heard from our listening sessions. One of the biggest things we will also say is take the time to read our guide, read it, digest it, understand it, look into our partners that we've had and figure out where do you fit in as it relates to the guide. And you can reach out to any one of us as it relates to the prospective organizations to really talk about some of the concerns that you may have. And I will reiterate exactly what uh, Maddie, Nicole and Lakeisha has shared is make sure you get out to vote, exercise that vote. Make sure you're voting in for individuals who um, are looking at some of the um, things that are most important to you. So it's not about if they are Democrat, Republican, independent. It's really about are you putting people in office that represent your priorities? And so making sure you're taking the time to research them and using any one of the mechanisms that have been put out by Lakeisha, ourselves, and with uh, Quelf to understand some of those who are running. And then lastly, use us as a resource. And so you've heard from Lakeisha, Maddie, Nicole, myself, and also even Karen, just use us as a resource um, to ask the questions that you might not um, have the answers to, and we will direct you to the right people. And so I will um, turn it over to Karen if we have any additional questions before we wrap up our time together. I think we are out of time for questions, unfortunately, so we're going to reshare our slides and, and I hope you all will stick around for just a few more minutes um, while we close this out and, and ask for some more. Thank you, Karen. So before we close out, I would love to discuss with all of you, which are the areas of your top priority in the poll? So take the time as I'm talking to look at the poll that's being launched. Um, and for those of you who are on social media, you can definitely take the time to place it into the chat and our team will let us know what your responses are. This is important for us to look at as you talked about getting involved. We really wanna understand what the community um, is looking for. Also in the chat, let us know what you're doing to make equity a reality in Connecticut. This is helpful for us. It's helpful for our, our, uh, the organizations that we partner with. And it will also help guide some of the things that we're looking to do in the future. We'll give you a few more minutes uh, before we share out the top priorities from the poll. So again, please take the time to click on your top priority. And as you are doing the poll, I'm going to go ahead and Thank you all for the time that you have spent with us. There are absolutely different ways, there are more than different ways that you can get involved to the work to help dismantle racism and construct health equity in Connecticut. We invite you to join us. And then this can happen by, it's not too late to reach out to our own Harley Webley, who is a member of Health Equity Solutions. And her email address is being put into the chat to add your organization's name to the Path to Equity Guide. 
And if you cannot sign on now, please let us know uh, what's happening and also know that we are listening to what you have to say. And we would welcome any feedback to incorporate in the next iteration of the Connecticut's Path to Equity. So please make sure that you reach out. We would love to hear some of the things that you have to say. As you see on the screen that's being shared, these are the top priorities. And so right now, based on the chat and the polling, anti-racist structures are our top priority. Access. And then there's a tie between access, economic stability, and opportunities to be healthy. So we want to thank you all for taking the time to do our poll. We ask that you attend candidate forums and ask questions. Those are happening this week. So please make sure you're taking the time to look at those candidate forums. Uh, reach out to um, us in other organizations and how you are putting Connecticut's path to equity into action. We also wanna share that the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving is sponsoring a series of statewide and correctional debates being hosted by the Connecticut League of Women Voters and Connecticut uh, Public Health excuse me, in Connecticut Public. For more details, visit ctpublic.org backslash vote. This is an opportunity for you to engage and understand what's happening with those who are running for office. Vote, vote, vote. You've heard it from HES, you've heard it from Lakeisha, and you've also heard it from Nicole, Nicole and Maddie. It's, this is the time to get out and vote. And make sure that you are asking your friends, family members, if they're registered to vote, if they need to change an address, if they need to change a party affiliation. And also just as a caveat, those who are involved, who have been just as impacted, making sure that they know that they have the opportunity to vote if they have um, are not on probation and have paid their fines and fees. You can testify at the Connecticut State Legislature in support of these initiatives that we've talked about today. Also, you can sign up for newsletters for our organizations to learn how, when, and get more information on how to be involved. And lastly, you can spread the word to your friends, family, and networks about what we're doing, uh, these three organizations, on how we are working together to get to health equity. Please find the media toolkit in the chat, and please reach out with any questions, comments that you may have. And there are also ways to engage with other partners that are included in the chat below. So again, we wanna thank you for your time, for spending with Health, Equ Health Equity Solutions, Lakeisha Grant Washington with the Hartford Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Nicole and Maddie, um, as it relates to Guelph. We wanna thank you both, uh, well, all three of you all for your partnership and the work that you're doing. And we are looking forward to the continued partnership as we're moving forward. Thank you all, and we hope that you'll join us next time as we continue to engage and talk about health equity. Have a wonderful day, everyone.